Hi everyone, I'm David Wong, Chief Information Officer at the National Library of Australia in Canberra. From wherever you are, welcome to this online only event being recorded at the National Library. Through the internet, we can connect with people and places across the country. However, it's important that we take a moment to connect with people and places in which we find ourselves. I acknowledge and celebrate the traditional owners of the land on which the library sits, the Namri and Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. I thank them for caring for this land on which we at the library are privileged to work. In this special online only event, National Library staff members and board game enthusiasts, Stuart Baines and Aaron Minahan are joined in conversation by illustrator and game designer, Samuel Millam. Many people don't realize the library has its own extraordinary collection of board games. More than just an entertaining pastime, they are a fascinating historical pers perspective of events and society. I loved playing chess when I was younger, especially with my dad, my neighbors and my friends. And when I think back, I'm not sure if I was just really good or if my dad let me win. Having said that, with my kids, I just bought them Mousetrap last week and it's a fantastic game and I so much prefer them playing that than playing on the iPad. So whether you're a Scrabble Master, a Monopoly Tycoon or the one to beat in Ticket to Ride, we hope you enjoy this journey into the National Library of Australia's board game collection and Australia's current board game landscape. We hope that it inspires you to delve deeper into the library's collection or to play a board game with family and friends. Welcome to the National Library of Australia on the shores of Lake Burley Griffin in Canberra. We are here for an event today, Are You Bored Yet? About Board Games. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, of which we are filming the event on today, and the land where you might be watching this, the local Indigenous peoples there and the traditional owners, and if you haven't already, do some research and find out who those, those owners are. Um, Today we are joined by Sam Millam from Melbourne via Zoom and Aaron, who I have next to me here. Um, Aaron and I both work here at the National Library. Um, we are not librarians, although our cardigans should give us away as working in a library. Uh, we are not librarians, we work in the public engagement section and we both have an interest in board games. And what you may not know is that the National Library has a board games collection. So today we want to explore a little bit about that and about the board games industry in general. The first thing I will clarify though is today we won't just be talking about strictly board games before someone writes in the comments that a game of cards is not a board game. We're really referring to tabletop games in general, so role playing, card games, board games, you name it. We've got it in our collection so we're going to cover off a little bit of all of that stuff. At the moment we find ourselves in a time of pandemic um, with COVID around the world. Uh, a lot of people are locked indoors or spending, certainly spending more time indoors than they normally would have. So board games are becoming possibly more popular and certainly statistics would tell us that that is true. Like most of you, um, I played board games when I was a child. I have fond m memories of playing canasta with my cousins and my nana, um, moving on to things like Monopoly and Trivial Pursuit not my favourite games and I still remember tearing the Trivial Pursuit board in half with my sister at one side of the board and I on the other. Um, but we've all played childhood games, we all have those kind of memories. What are your first memories, Aaron, of childhood games? Uh, I would think much the same as you, Stu. Um, uh, cards, playing cards with my nan um, and then yes, the inevitable family squabbles over Monopoly. Um, and another game I remember very fondly is a game of Frankenstein where you had to collect, collect bolts as you moved around the board and then whoever got to the end square first got to put the bolt in a little mechanism and it woke Frankenstein up. Mm. Um, that was pretty cool. That was yeah. pretty cool. One that yeah. stands out for me. Like Mousetrap, I always love seeing that mm. trap come down at the end. Very <laughs> cool. Um, but, you know, games have evolved. Games are different now and we have a lot more variety uh, to choose from and certainly... Um, different types coming from different genres and, and covering all sorts of interests and lots of recent converts to, to board games. Um, we've got a little, a few statistics here to give you an idea of just how big the board gaming industry is. So market research in the US has estimated the global market value of board games to be around $7.2 billion in 2017. Now all of this study was 
done before COVID and they expected that to be $12 billion by 2023. So you can imagine now with the boom in board game sales and more people getting into board games, that's going to far exceed the $12 billion that they, they estimated. Uh, in the UK, uh, retail figures for April of this year, 2020, um, showed a 240% increase in the sale of board games and puzzles during the first week of the lockdown period. So it gives you some idea of just how many people are looking for different ways to entertain themselves and, and possibly, for the first time since they were children, getting into board games again and, and discovering the breadth of board games that are out there and uh, available. There are lots of developers. It's not just the big companies. Lots of indie developers are as well, Aaron. And I know you've got some of those um, games made by uh, indie developers yourself. I do, um, from big companies as well as kind of independent publishers and uh, the kind of indie developers in my collection. I would say within perhaps the last 10, 10 or 15 years, there's been a bit of a resurgence with um, board gaming, tabletop gaming, um, card games. I remember, you know, Back when I was growing up, playing board games was kind of a bit of a niche thing. It wasn't the cool thing to do. Um, but now it's, it's really taken off. And especially with things like the internet, Kickstarter, um, all of those kind of crowdfunding, um, crowdfunding avenues, the board game market, I think, has really taken off. And those figures um, that you quoted before um, would very much tend to... Um, support that. Support that, yes. Thank you. Um, so probably what a question that many people out in our audience are asking, and certainly it's a question I asked when I first found out, why does the library collect board games? I think it's the first question that everyone asks when you say, oh, the library has board games. Um, here at the National Library, it's, it's sort of our mission, it's our reason for existing um, to to collect published material um, created by Australians, created in Australia, created about Australia. And it's our job to kind of collect and preserve that for current generations and future generations. Um, the things we collect are things that can give us a kind of snapshot of Australian life at any given point. And um, it gives us an indication of what we're reading, what we're seeing in the news, even what we're eating, we have a large collection of restaurant menus, which was news to me when I started here, but it's um, something quite cool. So why not the games we're playing as, as part of a snapshot of our culture? So Aaron, I imagine it's not someone's job here at the library to rock down to the local shops to buy these games. So how do they come into the collection? Hmm. If that was a job, I would be the first one to put my hand up for that, I think. I think you'd be in strong contention for that as well. Um, but thanks to the Copyright Act of 1968 and various uh, state acts, we have something called legal deposit. Uh, through legal deposit, we get most of the things that come into the National Library's collection. So legal deposit basically says that anything that is published here in Australia, book, magazine, even things like sheet music, one copy of that thing should be deposited here at the National Library. So this allows us to keep it, collect it and preserve it for future generations. But legal deposit kind of kind of lets us collect things as they're created. So we're not having to retroactively go back and try and fill gaps in our collection. We get it as it's happening. When it comes to board games, um, it's a little bit different because not everyone publishes a board game with a big games, like a big game studio. Some people self-publish, um, some people don't even publish. Um, but as I said, why, why not collect games as part of you know, a snapshot into our culture. So sometimes we get games into our collection through um, word of mouth. We have staff who are very interested in board games and they go th to things like PAX, CanCon, other game conventions. Um, and through their networks and um, these kind of conventions, they might get wind of, you know, a particularly interesting game, one that for some reason has some relevance to the National Library or our collections. Um, and those staff members from various collection areas may approach the game developer and just kind of say, look, we're interested in collecting your game because, you know, we think it, it deserves a place here. Um, and there are, you know, negotiations that are entered into. Um, sometimes the game creators will approach the library 
cold, basically, and say, look, I've got this game. It's published in Australia. I'm Australian. The theme is Australian. I'd really um, like you to consider taking it into your, taking it into your collections. Um, so we have some games here, some examples of games that were deposited by their creator. So the creator came to us. Um, so in front of us here, we have a game called 1066, The Year of Three Battles. So this is a maps-based game. Um, and it's basically reenacting the battles mm. of the battles in um, England in 1066, Hastings, um, things like that. And it's interesting because the maps themselves for the game was actually created using the National Library's collection of topographic surveys of the United Kingdom, which is which is pretty interesting, I think. Mm. Mm. So, Aaron, when I first came to the library in one of our education online resources in the digital classroom. And if you're a teacher, you should check this out. Um, we actually have um, some references to a very early board game from Australia that kind of explored the gold fields and it's, it's definitely an educational game. But what other kind of games do we have in our collection? Hmm. So there's definitely a big, uh, a big collection of the board games that are kind of around educational type of games. We have a lot of maps based board games. The board game collection is actually part of the National Library's map collection. Um, and most of the games that we have, as I said, um, are games about Australia, games published by Australians. Um, even kind of well-known international games, but with a kind of Australian twist. So the Goldfields game that you mentioned that is on the digital classroom, it's fairly old. Um, I'm not quite sure of the exact date, but it's late 1800s, something to that effect. We have another game here in front of me here. It's called the Mailman game. Um, it's educational in a way that it kind of it's a bit of a geography lesson. So players start um, up here in Melbourne, Melbourne Post Office, and it's a bit of a snakes and ladders kind of situation. You roll a dice, you move forward. You can come across bush rangers who, you know, set you back a few places. There's a flooded river at Ballarat. There's, you know, lots of things happening. And, um, you know, for school kids um, who have maybe never been outside of Melbourne or outside of their town, this, this would be, you know, something of a geography lesson. So we have things like the classic strategy games, Axis and Allies, we have a couple um, here behind us. Um, they, while not explicitly Australian or, um, you know, created by Australians, they do feature Australia. And of course, the Second World War was a big part of our history. So it's definitely something that has been deemed significant um, enough to come into our collection. We have Monopoly, the Australian Here and Now edition, but we also have the Sydney edition, as well as, of course, the classic Monopoly game that sparked so many arguments as children. <laughs> um, and we have, I think, one of my favourite games in the collection here. It's a game called Australia. So that's Australia, but with a Z instead of an S. Um, it's a new game, it was uh, created or published in 2018, and it's set in an alternate reality 1930s. The Northern Hemisphere is, something's happened, the land is poisoned, can't grow food, and at this particular, in this particular alternate reality, um, Australia, you know, is, is safe, and it's the last hope for humanity. So players have to kind of, they have to try and grow enough food to um, support mankind basically, but unbeknownst to players, there are aliens that lurk beneath the ground and they kind of awaken halfway through the game. It's, um, it's quite visually stunning as well as being very interesting. I feel like I need to add that to my collection. I think I might be going out and buying it straight <laughs> after this. <laughs> it's interesting that you talk about geography lesson lessons because I know that for me, Axes and Allies was a gateway drug for me into other more complex board games away yeah. from your monopolies and etc. Um, and certainly I learned a lot about geography through those games and you know the relationship in the, the Second World War and I ended up working in military museums for 11 years of my life. So it's interesting how board games can actually impact you. Yeah, yeah. So I know in the, our collection we've got some quirky and different games, small ones, big ones. In fact, we've got the biggest one in the world here next to me. Yep. Um, but can you give us a little bit of a, an insight into some of those games? Yeah, so, I mean, anyone who's into board games know that they come in all different shapes and sizes and there's kind of 
board games on any any theme. Um, so a few of the kind of I call them the est games, biggest, smallest, weirdest, those kind of things. So the biggest game we have in our collection, so in terms of physical size, is this one that's sitting in front of you, Stu. It's called The World in Flames. And um, sitting on top of the box right now is actually the Guinness World Record certificate indicating that it has taken the place for the world's largest game. So that's in terms of as I said, size, the board is something like two metres. Yep, it says here 23,279.3 centimetres squared. That's a big board. It is a very, very big board there. I think the count is 4,900 pieces and counters within the game. Um, and there are also several expansion packs that go with this game to make it even bigger because, you know, why not? Yeah, exactly. Yep. So that's the biggest game. Um, the oldest game we have in our collection is a maps-based game. It's from the 1750s, which is, you know, really bizarre to think, board games in the 1750s. And I'm sorry to any French speakers out there, I am going to butcher the name. Uh, but it's called the Map au Monde ou la Carte Générale de toute la Terre, and, which basically means a map of the world or um, kind of a general map of the entire world. And it's a geography lesson in a game. Players move their counters around a circular track. Each square um, correlates to a, a city or a country or an ocean somewhere in the world. And as players move through the board, they kind of learn little tidbits about the people, the weather, even what that country is renowned for producing as well. So again, another geography lesson in a game, It's pretty cool. What's the weirdest game in the collection for you, <laughs> your opinion? What's the weirdest game in our collection? Uh, that's a pretty loaded question. Um, but for me, some of the weirder, um, more slightly unusual games that we have in our collection is the Rex Hunt's Fishing Adventure game. Uh, it was produced in about 1992. So for those of us who remember the Rex Hunt's Fishing Adventures TV show, it is based directly off that. It's a map of Australia. You move around Australia learning facts about fish. Because, Sounds riveting. Because why not? Apparently um, you have to kiss that one before you put it back <laughs> on the shelf. I haven't tested that out, but please be my guest. <laughs> um, the other game we have, we have it here on the table, it's called the Les Evans Wine Options Game. Sounds more my speed. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Basically, it's a game, um, it's a party type of game. So one person acts as the sommelier. They um, choose a selection of wines. It's decanted out into non-labeled jars or glasses. And the game actually includes blindfolds. So the people who are playing are blindfolded and they have to try the wine and they have to try and identify what wine it is, what the vintage is, where it comes from. So for those who are into wine, it's yeah. definitely your game. Now, I'm really into that already, <laughs> just based on possibly on the wine alone, yeah. but can we play it? No. Even though we have a fantastic collection of board games here, you can come to the library, you can call them up, you can look at them, but you cannot play the games here at the National Library. So for me, I'm kind of very conflicted because I love nothing more than opening a brand new board game and seeing all the pieces still in their cardboard, unpunched, unfolded. Um, but at the same time, I love just kind of getting them out and diving into a game. So unfortunately, no, you cannot play any of the games in our collection. That is a shame. It is a shame. A you won't bit. find any unpunched games in my house because that's the first thing I do, <laughs> even if I haven't played them. Um, so we're going to move on now to talk to Sam Millam. So a bit of an introduction on Sam. Um, Sam is publishing card games with a focus on fun, wacky themes through online crowdfunding platform Kickstarter. Combining his skill set of graphic design, marketing and illustration, he has turned his side project of creating games late at night into a full-time career. And he's now helping other Aussie designers get their games made with his small startup, greatgames.com.au. Welcome, Sam. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for patiently listening to us talk about our collection. So, That's been great. a couple yeah, thank, of questions for you, you, Sam. Um, how would you describe what it is that you do? Uh, well, basically, um, 
the crowdfunding platform Kickstarter uh, is a way for Aussies and anyone around the world really to uh, come up with an idea, um, you know, sort of work on something uh, and then sort of bring it out into the world for people to uh, pledge and back and support. Um, and then basically that idea uh, with uh, then gets made. Um, so it's sort of like, it's almost like a short campaign. It's like a 30-day campaign. Um, so you sort of design your game, you get everything ready to go, um, and it just enables people to publish games, um, especially board games, and sort of know your production run, so your numbers um, based on how many people uh, would would like to purchase that game, um, yeah. And then you, you have to then, uh, once it, it reaches its funding goal, um, then you send it out to all your backers, and people get to play it. Yeah, it's, it's a great system, and it, I think, as we kind of touched on in the beginning, it it just opens up the possibilities for so many people um, to not only explore their talent and what they're interested in, but kind of share that with other like-minded people. So, Sam. How did you get started in board games? So both playing board games, like what's your earliest game memory? And how did you get started in the actual design process of board games? Yeah, probably the earliest memory would be playing uh, Rummy King uh, with my grandparents. So growing up, uh, we always used to go around to their place and they'd always have the real old fashioned board games and sort of some of the old classics and stuff. And like you guys said as well, Monopoly, we played a lot of just the traditional ones. Um, yeah, Rummy King was great because that was the, I normally hate numbers, and maths and everything because I'm sort of an arty type. Um, but Rummy King for some reason was just so much fun with adding up all the numbers and having all the runs. And uh, yeah, so a lot of that. And we sort of, come from a small coastal town originally. So there wasn't much uh, to, you know, to go out and buy board games. So uh, my parents would always, whenever we went out, out of town, we'd, uh, we'd love to stock up on heaps of board games and then bring them back to the town. So, yeah, so that was always something to look forward to growing up and, yeah, family board game nights, really. So when you're, Sam, when you're coming up with an idea for a game, what comes first for you? Is it the artwork? Is it the the concept, or is it the audience? What? How does that process actually happen? It's a little bit different with each campaign. Um, so I think to date, I think I've done about five, five or six campaigns so far. Um, but each one's been a little bit different. For some of them, like the earlier ones, that have started off very simply, um, just with coming up with the theme idea. So I sort of, I wanted to do like a funny, just a very sim simple kids uh, memory game, like a matching card game. But I didn't want it to be like sort of boring and just be about just like matching animals or something. So um, I just came up with the idea of uh, matching magical monsters with the magical monster poop. Um, <laughs> And then I tried to think, what, what, what could these people be doing? And I, I thought, oh, they could be plumbers or something in like a magical world. Um, and then I sort of came up with the idea of fairy god plumber, um, which was, you know, you were, you were this fairy plumber in, you know, fairyland and you had to try and match all the, all the monsters, you know, to help their, their plumbing needs. But, um, yeah, so each, thing's, each campaign is different. Um, it usually does start with the theme um, and then... I sort of try and build the game around that. So most of my games are fairly simple, um, but easy to learn, and they're just sort of fast and fun with, um, you know, with a with a family group in mind. Um, yeah. So yeah, but each one's different. Mm, that's great. Um, I actually have a copy of Fairy God Plumber on the way. <laughs> I'm actually really looking forward to it for some <laughs> bizarre reason. Um, awesome. So. That's your kind of um, design process, kind of what you're thinking about when you're coming up with these games. Do you find kind of being involved in the kind of Australian board game landscape, do you find that Australians gravitate to a particular type of game? Do, do Australian gamers have a type, a preference of games, or it's just kind of a bit of everything? 
Yeah, it, it seems the games that go well with the Australian market um, is sort of like games with humour. Uh, I think like most Aussies have a great sense of humour, so they sort of gravitate towards something they can play as a group or, um, yeah, sort of a lot of a lot of party games that are sort of popular at the moment. Um, but then there's also the really hardcore audience that love really big thematic game that takes hours to set up and hours to play. Um, so there's sort of like a... It's almost like, yeah, like what you were saying, a niche group inside of that general sort of board board game market that love those really uh, com- complex games. Um, but I think also uh, sort of if we're talking like the mainstream games that are out there, you know, your targets and, you know, like the, the big sort of stores and things like that, um, a lot of them are very s- traditional still. So it's sort of like people uh, overseas, uh, there's a lot of different board games and in Australia it, the mainstream market hasn't quite caught up just yet with overseas um, but I think it's slowly starting to we're starting to see some interesting games pop up on shelves um, which is great um, but yeah so a lot of traditional games and a lot of people will just say Monopoly or you know Yahtzee things like that but yeah so but hopefully um, a lot more games continue to keep popping up and on, on shelves. So how hard is it for you? I mean, I have a slight crowdfunding game addiction um, and there's lots of platforms, Kickstarter, Indigo, Patreon, GoFundMe, there's a whole bunch of them. But um, how hard do you find it, particularly in our market, to get your game from a Kickstarter game to a retail game? Is that something that's easy to do? Yes, yes, it is. Um, because everything is so digital now, um, the main, probably the, one of the main issues when I first started was the shipping costs uh, because a lot of your customers were coming from overseas as well. Um, firstly, you had to get all the copies, you know, to Australia and then you had to get all the copies, you know, to all different countries all over the world as well as Australia. Um, so it's almost like it's double, double handling. Um, and so that was sort of the main issue with uh, probably why it is a bit hard to get started with making board games in Australia, self-publishing. Um, but as, as you grow and start getting more projects done and more, more people, more customers, more backers, um, you can then outsource to a distribution fulfillment center um, who handle all the shipping for you. Um, they, they do cost a little bit extra, but with volume, it's, um, it is a lot more easy to then just keep making games. Um, yeah, so originally I was just sending them all out with OzPost. <laughs> um, so that was quite difficult, but uh, yeah, the, the more you learn about it, um, you are sort of constantly learning with how to find ways around um, some of the difficult steps uh, to publishing, yeah. How would you describe the, the uh, game design landscape in Australia today? So I asked you about what Australian consumers uh, are kind of after. Um, but my question is more, how do Australian game studios and Australian game designers, how are they kind of faring in the wider international market, you know, competing with the big names of, um, you know, the big game studios? How do you think Australia is faring? I think uh, on a on a small level they're doing great. Um, there's a lot of really good ideas uh, coming out, and there's there's a lot of sort of smaller publishing uh, studios popping up all all across Australia now. Um, and I think probably some of the bigger name games that are getting made it's still through the traditional publishing houses. Like there's few games, uh, university games, and they're an overseas company, but they have offices in Australia. Um, so, you know, bigger name publishing houses like that, a lot of Australian uh, designers are still going through that method, not going the self-publishing route. Um, but, yeah, so they do have a large distribution network where people, you know, you can submit your game idea, come up with a good game idea, and they'll handle everything. But they will only, you know, give you a certain percent of all the sales. So there are a lot of smaller publishing uh, 
yeah, companies popping up in Australia um, now though. So that's, yeah, that's great to see. Mm, it is great to see and it's, it's kind of good to think that it will continue to grow and Australia yeah. you know, may get a bigger share of that market. Now, Sam, your background is as a graphic artist before you made board games, is that right? Yes, yes. So, yeah, uh, originally started as an illustrator um, and then I moved into graphic design uh, and then that sort of just naturally led to a whole digital world of, yeah, marketing um, and, yeah, digital design. So those, all those skills sort of came together um, with my love for games and board games and um, yeah, I just started doing it as a hobby and they, a lot of people... It is actually hard to, for people who don't have all of those particular skills to then have to hire people you know, to, to do the art and then have to do the design and then you have to come up with the, the, the game idea. Um, so it kind of helps having those skills um, to sort of just do it all yourself. Um, and so that's helped a lot with now moving into the full time. I certainly know that, and Aaron and I have had this discussion many times in the office about how important it is for some people that their first impression of the game, the artwork or the box or the components is really important to whether they go on to purchase. And I know for me, I came to know your games through Lost in Valhalla, which I have also ordered and is on the way. Um, but that was because of the art. The art just appealed to me on some kind of, it was fun, it was, I could relate to it, the inner child in me related to it, but also the gameplay and the idea of the game was really fun as an adult. Um, do you think that's kind of a more common way for people these days to get into games? Through the artwork? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, for sure. It's almost like back in the 80s and 90s where people buying comic books based on sort of the art or the artist i think it's all, almost the same now these days um with board games and card games um, people might love a particular art style and their collection will show you know that um but yeah i think it could be also yeah they, they do love that certainly helps people get into the game which is the art but then also they still still need to be fun to play um, so yeah it is a bit of both but Definitely, the art definitely helps, yeah. And Sam, do you have any any tips or any advice for, you know, any kind of aspiring illustrators, artists, game designers, anyone with an interest in board game, board games, if they want to try and get into the game designing industry, um, do you have any tips for those people? Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely join uh, some Facebook groups um, I think there's one called Tabletop Game Designers Australia. That's probably the biggest um, people can, you know, you share your ideas and people comment and, and sort of support each other. Um, a lot of really smart people there as well that help you out with mechanics and ideas. Um, it's another great place to team up with people to help complement your skills. So if you are an artist, you could maybe meet someone there that, that's a great designer or, you know, uh, someone who can help, yeah, offset your skills. Um, yeah, so I would probably say, yeah, definitely join some Facebook groups um, yeah, and, and try and find some people to help, um, yeah, with, with skills that you might not have. Mm, so kind of build, get into and build a bit of a network and then kind of, kind of branch out from there. Yeah, that's some really, yeah. some really great advice for anyone who's kind of ever dreamed of designing a game or, you know, anything like that. So I guess our last question for you, Sam, is during you're in Melbourne, you're in lockdown, um, do you have a go-to game at the moment? And you can say one of your own, that's fine. But do you have a go-to <laughs> game at the moment that you're playing? Yes. Uh, yeah, we have a couple. Um, one that we're trying to get through is called Tapestry. And that is one of the giant take, you know, takes 12 days to set up the game. And then by the time you finish setting it up, you're finished <laughs> anyway. You're like, okay, it's time to go to bed. Um, so we're trying to get through that one, which is a bit more complex, but fun. Um, and then some of the more simple sort of easy ones. Um, we have just a bunch of sort of funny games like 
unicorns, um, just the simple sort of card games. Magic Maze is another one. Um, yeah, so just a, just a whole mix, really. Yeah. That's great. Stu, what about you? What's your go-to game? Ooh, game um, at the moment, um, Dreary Hamlet, which is a Canberra-based game, came out a few years ago. Um, he's a... It well, it was a family favourite, except I kept winning, so now no one wants to play it. Um, Kill the Unicorns is up there as well, so things that we can get out quickly and play, and then, yep. Mm. What about you? Uh, I think my go-to game is probably probably Tokaido. I think it's a it's a great kind of easy game to play with a lot of people. The artwork is absolutely stunning. Um, that and probably. Maybe Carcassonne, go really old school and play some Carcassonne is my go-to, I think. Excellent. Well, that's the whole box and dice. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, and check out the National Library's board game collection and all the rest of our collection online.